check that out right there. In the past, we've talked a lot about the lacinato of the dinosaur kale, but this is more of a, what I, I call like a frilly leaf kale. And I've grown a lot of, there's several different varieties out there of this style of kale. And the commercial guys around here grow a lot of this too. You, you wanna grab you one? Here. So uh, in the past, I've tried several different varieties. Uh, there's one called winter boar. There's one called darker boar. There's one called star boar, all similar to the style. This is a variety as far as I know, maybe there's one other company online you can get it from, but it, it's pretty much exclusive to us. Uh, this variety is called Blue Ridge, and it's an improved variety of this curly leaf kale here. And I can tell you this is, I will vouch for this variety here. It's done a lot better than the star boar and the darker boar and the winter boar that I've grown in the past. Blue Knight. Blue Knight, that is a pretty kale. Now is this an open pollinator or is this a hybrid? It's a hybrid. It's a, it's a hybrid, but this particular variety is supposed to do really well for the stripping the leaves and keep growing like we do the collars. And so far, it has done really well for me. And, and I believe it's the variety that is grown around here across the road. Uh, so when did you plant this? When I planted that stuff, we was waiting on the temperatures to break. So it was probably September or so. So you got it a good, you got it up growing good before the cold weather come in here. Oh yeah, and it likes the cold. The cold, they kiss it a little bit. This stuff can take a pretty good frost. Yeah, actually, you know, the old timers and they was correct. That that cold weather make your greens sweeter. Mm -hmm. Now, now, whether you believe this or not, this right here came off one plant. Wow, and, that's nice. Uh, I got the lost note, lost knowledge growing my garden. I've got some of that too, and uh, that's a staple for me. I always grow that. But this right here, if you're gonna make you a kale salad. This does really good, and let me tell you why. So you've got more, because the leaves are crinkled, you've got more surface area there to absorb a dressing or whatever you want, oh. uh, some olive oil, whatever you put in there. So uh, when you're doing a salad like that, you want to do something with some crinkles on it because it's got more surface area to absorb the flavoring of the and dressing. And the presentation is, is more profound. That's right, that's right. I remember growing up at this local Shoney's buffet, they put this on your plate as a garnish. Um, and we didn't know no better then. We didn't, need it. We didn't think you're supposed to eat it. <laughs> you're dating yourself a little bit there with the Shoney's buffet. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's say hey to everybody. Hello everyone and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And this is our weekly garden show where we talk shop, uh, what's going on in the garden and answer some of your viewer questions from last week. If you're new to our channel, if this is your first time watching one of our videos, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and that bell notification button below so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you're a frequent viewer of the show, it's always good to have you if back. If you like gardening, growing your own food, you got to be a part of the Hall's Tools family. That's just pretty much simple. That's right. And if you're on Facebook and you're not a member of our row, by row group, what are you thinking? So just go on there, search Row by Row, and you can join our Facebook row group. By row. And uh, we've got lots of really experienced gardeners in there that like to share their pictures. And it's it's really friendly environment. You can ask questions, and there's a lot of people in there that can help you. And, and we stay on there pretty regularly. Yeah, and well, the good thing about it is, you know, we're in the deep south, so we understand gardening in the deep south, but we don't understand gardening up north a lot. So there's a lot of guys on there that live up north that have a profound knowledge base of gardening up north in cold weather, and they can help you out too. So regardless where you're at, join the group, post your questions, don't be shy about it, and somebody out there will come in there and be able to help you out. Yeah, not only questions, post pictures to brag about your garden. If your garden's looking good, we want to see it. So. Uh, join that group and do that. Speaking of the group and, and what we've been hearing from people lately, everybody's been worried about this cold spell coming through or that's that's it's working through here right now. Yeah, and it looks like we're going to have a colder year than what we normally have. Now, our average frost date is around the end of November, but, uh, you know, for the last few years, it ain't been on time. But this year, it looks like it, it crept in here and got us, got us where it's supposed to. So, so we've had some cold weather. We're having to get adjusted to it a little bit. I wish I'd have done some things a little bit earlier than what I did. I was, you know, when the heat was here, and it seemed like one week it was hot as fire, the next week it started getting real cold. But, you know, you got to get those plants out there when it's, when it's still warm, get them growing good, so when that cold weather does come through here, 
it didn't zap them. When those plants are small, a lot more, you know, they can take, they can't take the cold weather like they can when they get big, just like that kale there. That kale there can take a good bit of <coughs> cold weather, but when it's just coming out of the dirt, it's susceptible to getting knocked back. Susceptible. Susceptible, that's mm. a new word. Okay. Yeah, I was talking to a fella in uh, mm. Arizona and he basically said, he's like, man, we didn't have a fall. He's like, it was hot and, it was and, and we basically experienced the same thing. Yeah, we did. It's gonna cause some trouble. My English peas, that I might not get any English peas. Uh, they're about a foot tall, and uh, you know I don't know if they're going to have time to do anything. Most years I would have been fine. Um, lettuce is going to be slow. Carrots are going to be slow. I should have got carrots in early October, but I was behind because everything else was pushed. And it's just one of those things. But we'll make do. Yeah, my English peas are pretty much a failure too, and I, I was looking forward to those. You know, I planted them early on, but I didn't get them up and didn't get them established for this cold weather. No, in a normal year, when you have that transition time, that's when your peas love to grow. And we didn't have that transition time, so, you know, they struggled a little bit with the heat, and then, bam, the cold weather hit them. And, you know, peas are one of those cool weather crops that will not hardly germinate in cold, cold soil. Yeah, mine are just creeping along now. My consultant farm, we planted... There's about two weeks before I planted mine, and I think they're gonna have a good stand. Yeah. And uh, but but I, I'm not uh, very hopeful with mine. If I do have a failure, which it looks like it may be, I plant some more this early spring and give it another try. A lot of people have been worried about should they cover their stuff in the cold, and and I can I can only speak to about the coldest it ever get here, maybe 15 degrees, and that's rare. So I can only speak to to that. I can't speak to how things hold up at zero or 10, but I will tell you, as far as getting down to 20 and 15, most everything in my garden is will be fine. Now, when you got a cold spell coming, and it, the drip makes it easy to do this because you don't want to leave a lot of moisture on them leaves because it'll, it'll freeze them and burn them, but if you got that drip, keep that soil nice and moist. It will help insulate the soil. Uh, I had a few years ago, as a market farmer I know in Mississippi, me and him had some beets going on right along the same time. It looked good. I, we got some cool spell come through and it just burnt mine and his stayed looking good. And the re reason was I didn't have enough soil moisture in place. Yeah, soil moisture is very important. Most people don't realize, but when those plants are, are stressed from, from drought or from dry weather, a lot more susceptible to that winter damage so it is very important now, i can speak a little bit further back on this temperature thing okay so back in either 83 or 85 it got down to eight degrees here and when it did it pretty much wiped out everything cabbage will split and bust down at those temperatures and that head will actually bust open it's no good after that so if it gets down to eight degrees uh you all your brassicas is pretty much going to be wiped out now the With one, the exception of collards, probably. Well, collards got burnt back, too. I think, I think best by memory, we lost everything. Oh, okay. Year. But it was a cold year. I mean, it, I remember it being in, we was out in it, and it was eight degrees. It was like during the daytime, so that's mm. how bad it was. So you're going to lose all your brassicas at that stage. Now, onions and things, I don't remember that. There's probably more people out there that can testify to core of that. I think you could probably, they would probably handle a little bit more than, uh, than the brassica family. Spinach. Cabbage and collards are probably three of the most cold resistant. Rutabagas are supposed to be Rutabagas really. are, are probably another one. Or, or the coldest ones, they can take a lot of cold. You know, down to the teens, I don't think you're going to have a problem. That being Single said, digits. I make, make no guarantees because if you get something in the low teens for a long period of hours, sometimes it makes a huge difference how long it stays that cold. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of variables there that can be you know, involved. We don't cover anything here. I start saying if you got covers, you want to cover something, it ain't going to hurt nothing. I don't think covering's a bad idea by no means if you want to go through the trouble and if you got the means to do it. But I don't think you're going to have any problems in the 20s with your rutabagas and your cabbage and your spinach and things like that. Yeah. So I wouldn't really get stressed out a lot about it. If we do see we're going to get down into the single digits, we got some issues there, and I'm not sure covering's going to help anyway. Um, Swiss chard, they tell me, really can't take any cold. I've never grown a Swiss chard, chard to know. We've grown it at the expo. Well, that we grew at the expo. Yeah. I was harvesting it all throughout yeah. the winter, and it did fine. Right, but, but I it, put some people <coughs> in the group that said that it just didn't do well in cold weather, and hmm. I thought it did well in cold weather. So It has for us, at yeah, least. I don't know. 
that's another one. Yeah. So uh, there you have it. You know, do the best you can. Your brassicas are not, when it gets this cold and stays this cold and your soil gets cold, they're not going to do a whole lot of growing. So it's going to pretty much sit there. You want to keep the fertilizer to them, get moisture to them. So when you do have those warm days, they pop back out a little bit. Yeah, they say onions can take, they can take 20 degree weather as long as it's just not sustained over three or four days. You know, it can take 20 degree nights as long as it's cooked, warming yeah. up in the day. Um, and think about it, your bulbs down in the ground, so it's insulated somewhat. If you do get some burn up there on top, those things can bounce back and shoot oh, yeah. the growth back up. Uh, the only thing, like I mentioned on my video this week, is if you've got broccoli heads out and cauliflower heads out, even though those plants could take it, uh, it'll turn those heads to mush. And I have covered some stuff before. If you're, you know, you've got broccoli heads that maybe aren't quite big enough to harvest, um, then you're in a little bit of dilemma there. You probably want to cover them. Gary Schmelzer mentioned that, and if you've got just a few broccoli plants, this is a great idea. Just take a plastic Walmart sack and throw over them plants and uh, yeah. and keep them covered. Now, the cold weather is going to give us some benefits because it's going to kill off a lot of our insects. So if we do have a cold winter, our insect pressure should be less next year. Cold weather, you know, it has its purpose. Yeah. Um, one more thing, I was talking to the folks at Dixondale, I know a lot of people waiting on the onion plants to ship. Evidently they had a real wet spell there and they just can't get out in the field and harvest them. So should be next week before those ship and uh, you know, give them folks over there a little bit of, of kindness and patience. I can promise you they want to get them onion plants oh, to yeah. you just as bad as you're wanting to get them. So uh, they'll get them out of there as soon as they can. Uh, one more thing, uh, or a few more things. Fig trees, so we're about to go all in on some fig varieties. We've got about 15 different fig varieties. We just got some cuttings and- uh, Got them in the greenhouse and rooting. Got them in there. We'll have to show you an update on that, but just, just kind of a, a, a tease there. We got some things coming with fig trees uh, down the line. Yeah, we got fig items pretty bad. And the more we look at them, the more varieties we want. And there's a bunch of, bunch of varieties out there different profiles and all that and we got a good sampling of all of them that's right there's about uh 610 to 15 different are. flavor profiles and we're trying we're going to have a variety for each profile yeah. and uh, supposedly there's over 600 varieties of figs out there worldwide they are a lot of that's them. a lot i had a video come out earlier this week on uh planting lettuce and uh get somebody commented on there and they said in the winter time when they're growing lettuce in the fall or the winter when you don't have to worry about as much plant disease and humidity they prefer to overhead water the lettuces put it on drip and they ask why don't we overhead water and you can you don't disease is not a big issue this time of year you can't overhead water i'll tell you why i don't like to overhead water lettuce it makes a mess on the plants and in an ideal situation, and I know this because we've grown it in the your high tunnel before, yeah, it's a lot and cleaner. it's so much cleaner. Yeah. If if I could, now there's other crops I need some rain for, but if I could have my way, growing lettuce, I'd rather than have zero rain, feed it all through the drip, and uh, it's just so much cleaner when yeah. you harvest it. You don't have to pull off a lot of the bottom leaves that have got uh, soil or dirt splashed on them. That's the reason I don't overhead, just to keep them clean. Yep. Another thing, uh, we've had several folks uh, on our customer service line asking about when our 2020 seeds were going to be packed. And I wanted to, to clear up something. So a lot of your seed companies out there, and I, I see their emails, they're, they're, all our 2020 seeds are here, our seeds are packed for 2020. We don't pack seeds by the year. Uh, we are always packing seeds and, and bringing them. We sell seeds year round. There's people buying seeds all the time uh, from us. So there's not a season for us. We do it year round. Um, I personally don't like the whole when people put pack for 2020 on that packet because you don't, you don't, that doesn't tell you anything. That just tells you when they pack. That doesn't tell you how old that seed is, when it was germ tested, what the germ rate is, anything. So we give you the germ test date and the rate on there. It's not packed for a particular year. It's a revolving door around here. And we'll be adding new varieties every day uh, or every week here throughout into the spring. Uh, so there's not like a, a certain date when you can 
buy those seeds they're always available yeah it's a busy time around here so if you want some seeds or you want to go ahead and you got cabin fever and you want to go ahead and get some of your seeds for the year place your order when you get them in put them in the refrigerator that'd be fine one more thing we just got a big container in this morning uh, the bottom trays for our seed starting trays and we've got some really nice indoor seed starting kits uh, a little smaller scale than those big trays. We got some exciting seed starting kits that's going to be available within the next week. Maybe next week on the show we can show some of them. Right. So those bottom trays, I know everybody's been waiting just like we have. And uh, it'll take us a few days to a week or so to get product pictures, get them on the site. And uh, once we do that, we'll let everybody know via our email newsletters, usually how we... We tell it everybody and if you're not subscribed to that you can scroll to the bottom of our home page and there's a little link there it says get the newsletter and uh, you'll be the first to know all right so now we got all that away the, the main topic for today's show uh, and we mentioned this on last week's show I had to make a little trip to Columbus uh, Mississippi which was quite a little ride yeah and um, on the way back I stopped by to see my buddy Jason at Cog Hill Farms and he has a, his videos don't do it justice. He has a beautiful place. It looks like the North Georgia mountains up there. It's absolutely beautiful. Hmm. Um, so we stopped by there for a couple hours and filmed a little segment that we wanted to air on the show tonight. Kind of a little impromptu interview just to kind of share with you some of Jason's homesteading philosophy and what he does and everything like that. And he was gracious enough to give us a couple hats. And uh, he sells these, I think, on his uh, you can get them off his YouTube page, but he makes these himself. Really? So these are the same kind of hats, the same Richardson hats that we use, uh, but he's got, he puts a logo on there himself. Wow. Uh, he's which, a talented fellow. So which is neat. when you get you one of these hats, you're officially part of the Cog Squad. Cog Squad, that's right. And uh, just from meeting with Jason before we roll this interview, I'll tell you that he is the real deal. Like what you see on his videos, he is the real deal. There's a lot of big gardening homestead YouTubers out there. I call them homestead phonies, and uh, you know who I'm talking about. Um, there's one in Missouri and one in North Carolina, but you got to watch out for, for some of those people. What they put on their YouTube channel is not how they actually live, but I can tell you firsthand, Jason is the real deal. So let's go ahead and roll that interview, and then we'll catch back with you once that's over. So I was rolling through Alabama today and I uh, wasn't too far away from Selma and Valley Grand, Alabama and I decided to stop in and see my good buddy Jason here at Cog Hill Farms. Uh, Jason's got a YouTube channel that we religiously watch, we really like and if you haven't seen his channel, go ahead and check that out, Cog Hill Farms, we'll put a link to that in the description below. Um, so Jason's here with me today, he's got a beautiful place, uh, really glad that he, uh, you know, let us stop by and check it out. This garden's looking good. Things are sprouting up. And we just want to ask Jason a few questions today just about gardening and homesteading and, uh, you know, kind of let us in a little bit on, on what you've been doing and how long you've been doing all Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So how long have you been homesteading out here and kind of what what led you to take that plunge? We, um, we've we been here 14, 15 years now. Uh, we lived in the town and like everything else it was a slow evolving process um i lived in town i got obsessed with my lawn yeah and then you know it looked like a um look i say it looked like a um baseball field i mean i just got obsessed with it and then that led into me getting obsessed with landscaping and then i got into gardening and then we decided to move to the country and we did and we were here for a little while and then it just then we got chickens and then we got goats and it just it just kind of just blew up from there so it wasn't it was just a little bit at a time a and then all of a sudden you turn around and was like oof what have it, i got myself exactly into exactly what happened exactly <laughs> what happened <laughs> good deal uh so you got a lot going on right here you got goats mm -hmm. you got geese you even got a peacock mm -hmm. your garden peaches so everybody knows about peaches <laughs> What's your favorite homesteading activity? What's your favorite thing uh, that you enjoy doing? I probably gardening. Really? Really? Yeah, I love to garden. I mean, that's that's how I got into it. That's how, you know if I never would have got obsessed with 
with landscaping and flowers and shrubbery and then gardening and that's and we wouldn't be here so that's to me i love gardening and yet y'all y'all obviously eat a lot of things fresh y'all right. put up some stuff in the put garden too stuff, yeah um garlic's one main thing that we did we really just put up the uh winter squash which we did the uh, acorn squash this year no was it butternut Butternut squash. Butternut squash. Yeah. And um, we used to store for a while. For a while. We usually do Seminole pumpkins, but we did those instead this year. And, and the Seminole pumpkins will last, I, I swear, they'll last two years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll last Real good forever. shelf life for And they're so good. Um, speaking of the garden, so you mentioned the pumpkins. What's your, if you had one crop, your favorite crop to eat out of the garden that you grow, what would that be? Oh, man. You know, first initial thing was tomatoes. Everybody loves tomatoes. Everybody loves tomatoes. And I could eat BLTs every day. Oh, man. Every day. Oh, man. Yeah. So I, I, w I would probably have to go with tomatoes. I'm about the same way. We like to always keep some bacon cooked in the fridge yes, at the house that way. Absolutely. Spur of the moment, you can make a BLT anytime. <laughs> anytime. And we don't even need the ale. Yeah. Well, we can just do BTs. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Or we can just do teas, yeah. one of the two. So I yeah. got to have some mayonnaise on mine. Mayonnaise, that's right. Got to have some yep. Duke, Duke's mayonnaise. I don't know what's the preferred mayonnaise around this part of the world. Around here is the, um, is where they, is, you know, you got Bama mayonnaise, which is pretty popular around here. So. Oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, so, what would you say if, if somebody was wanting to get into this lifestyle? Mm -hmm animals gardening maybe both or maybe just one what would be the best advice you would give somebody who was wanting to to dip their toes in this homestead and lifestyle number one is don't be scared mm -hmm. and don't be scared of making mistakes um i think that's what a lot of people get worried about and I always tell people a lot of times too don't try to put yourself in a box either because i did it and I think a lot of people get intimidated by it, but they see folks like Joel Salatin or Justin Rhodes or whatever, and you know they, they preach that you know you got to feed this kind of feed or you got to grow this kind of seed, you got to do it this way, you got to have this compost, you got everything's got to be organ and organic, and then next thing you know, you've blocked yourself in this little box, and you end up not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people just do the best you can with what you got, because not everybody's got access to organic feed or, or or organic fertilizers or or just that stuff in general you know just do what you can yeah we see that with gardening you know a lot of people out there everybody's got a different soil type everybody's got a different environment everybody's right. got a different pest pressure so you know, while something like the back the eating garden may work well for some folks it it doesn't really work that well for us right and, and i see you you don't really i, I don't i don't really do it and I, a matter of fact i had a friend that did try it and you know it it, it was horrible <laughs> it was terrible he did this stuff did awful in it yeah yeah but a lot of people have really good success, have good with, success it. So, with it yep. so and going back to what you said you just got to find what works for find you. Find what works for you and what's available to you. You know, if you can't, you know, if you're in a rural place and down the road, you know, you can't get certain things, you know, you just can't get it. Yeah, we live out in the country and uh, I don't know about here, but where we live, I can't really get my hands on a truckload of really finely well done compost. I can't either. So yeah, I have yeah. to use manure. Chicken manure, Chicken cow manure, manure, whatever I can get whatever my hands on. Whatever you can get your hands on. That's right. It's the same way here. And um, I, a lot of times, like with feed, you know, I hear people, you know, say I can't grow my chickens because I can't get non-GMO feed, you know, where we're at. And a lot of rural areas, you're not. Or if you do, you're going to pay $50, 60 a bag for it. So, you know. And that, that can become cost prohibitive, cost prohibitive real quick. Right. right. And I always tell people, whatever you grow on your property is going to be way better than whatever you're going to buy in the store anyway. So don't worry about it. Right. Do what you do. Do what you do. Good deal. Going back to the garden real quick, <clears throat> what would you say was, the say in the last year or mm -hmm. so, the biggest game changer, something you've done differently in your garden that's been the biggest game changer for the way you garden or how productive your garden is? I would say this year, and this is going to sound like a plug for all tools, but it's not the... Um, Cultivating with a wheel plow in between my rows every other day was a to me was a huge game changer. 
Mm -hmm. My reads this year are almost non-existent this year. Mm -hmm. And geese are getting after it. Yeah, geese are getting after it. <laughs> the kids are there. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and that that was that was big. Usually, so usually we, that weed pressure is terrible. Yeah. And what what's sometimes the message is hard to convey to folks. And the wheel hub makes it easy to do this, but it does make you got to get out there and do a little shallow cultivation yes. when you don't really see any leaves. Yep. It's more of a, it's a proactive technique than it a reactive. A very proactive technique. That's right. We got a train of geese walking by us right here. <laughs> geese parade. It is a geese parade. <laughs> So you got the double wheel hoe, and what's your favorite attachment for going there and cleaning out or, or keeping the weeds? I like the new sweeps that y'all came with. It looks like the... The wing sweeps? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And those help to kind of maybe throw a little dirt up on yeah. the crops too. Right. Good deal. Good deal. Let's see what else we got here. So you got a really nice place out here. You got, looks like you got everything well under control. What's your future homestead dreams? What's some type of homesteading activity that you don't currently do that you'd like to add to the mix? As if you're not oh, busy wow. enough. Yeah, if you're not busy enough, because we've tried just about everything. We've had pigs, um, rabbits, chickens. Um, our, our main plan right now is, is, of course, we're building the bigger chicken coop, and we're going to get more proactive or more involved in selling eggs which we've tried in the past and not 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 too great with it mm -hmm. um but extending my garden making my garden bigger you know at some point i would love to dabble in market garden yeah i would love to dabble in it and see if i got a market here and then see something i could do mm -hmm. and then i could tie the eggs to it and maybe do like a csa box mm -hmm. i would love to kind of start on that and see if I could possibly do that and then that may migrate and get into a hoop house and go from there but market garden is something that's on the back of my mind big time yeah we do a little bit of that and it's fun it's fun you have to as with anything not get too head over heels with it because right. you end, end up working way more right. than you, you need to <laughs> but uh it's fun and if you got a nice productive garden and you got some extra stuff it's it's a great way to share that with other right. people and maybe even, you know, hopefully, you know, our end goal is always to inspire other people to want to grow yeah, their own that's clean true. food. That is true. Yeah, I can see that. Absolutely. Our next question, which is a little different than what we've been talking about. So how long have you been dancing? Were you ever how classically long? trained or no. you just you just like to dance? Ever in since I was or? walking. Okay. I was dancing. And then then when I was young, that's when Michael Jackson broke out, and that's when break dancing broke out. Okay. So I was a big breaker, and matter of fact, when I was seven years old, there was this huge break dancing contest. Of course, all these people were 18 plus years old, mm -hmm. and so I entered it and almost backed out because I was like, you know, this is this is crazy. I'm seven years old, and I won. Yeah. <laughs> So, but it's just kind of migrated from there, and then it started, you know, hip hop and freestyle, and that's all it was. And then as I got older, I'm just not that mobile anymore like I used to not be. As limber, are <laughs> not as limber, not as limber. My daughter started taking tap and jazz, and I was like, you know what? I maybe I can do that. So I started taking tap and jazz, and now it's just tap. And I'm not very good at it, believe it or not, but I'm learning it. So, so yeah, nothing classically trained until now. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, you could have fooled me. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing, the last question, and this is probably the, the biggest question. We get this on our channel a lot, and in a lot of popular homestead channels, people wonder, time. Yeah. How do you manage your time doing all this you've got work a full-time job mm -hmm. i work a full-time job how do you manage all this without going absolutely crazy you gotta love it because if you don't you're not going to do it you got to you got to especially the homestead lifestyle the gardening not to mention you gotta love making youtube videos because if not you're gonna get burned out yep um i got a podcast you got you just gotta love doing it Cause if not, cause everybody's got the same amount of time. Everybody does. It's just how you yeah, utilize. People that it. say they don't have time for something. Yeah. 
uh, I heard a, a guy at a, a conference I was at, he said, everybody's got the same amount of time. It's just certain people use their resources better than others. I agree 100%. That's why I say you got to love it because everybody's got the same amount of time. 24 hours in every day. 24 hours in every day. <laughs> you know, I got a little studio and I actually got a little bed in my little studio upstairs. So if I'm late editing videos, I can just go to sleep up there and get yeah. up and go to work next morning. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, good deal. Well, we appreciate you Shoot, having us yeah, here, man. Thank and you. we appreciate you giving us a little insight into your homesteading life. Absolutely. And uh, like I said, people out there, if you haven't subscribed to Jason's channel, go on over there to Cog Hill Farm and do that. And uh, you do videos three times a week. I try to do three times a week. Um, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Sundays. And I got a podcast. It normally comes out on Mondays, but. It usually it's one day that week, but typically on Mondays on the podcast. All right, good deal. So check him out three times a week, Cog Hill Farms. We'll see you guys. All right, we're back. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I know it got a little louder. A couple spots, some geese started hollering on us. <laughs> and uh, boy, he has some well-behaved farm animals, don't he? I can just see my dog tank in, in the midst of all them geese and. Pet pigs and chickens. He's got around. he's got three or four dogs and they don't bother the Ooh, animals. Well, tank would have him a time here. There's chickens. There, it's like old McDonald Farm. There's chickens, goats. He's got a big old Tom Turkey. Uh, little Titus walked up to you. You can just pet him. He's just mm. sweet as he can be. Uh, it, it's it's a nice place he's got. There. Real nice folks. I mean, you know, you can tell the camera's friendly to him. But just real, the kind of people you'd want for neighbors, really. And uh, as far as his garden goes, he's got the same problem everybody else has got. He he wants a bigger garden, but he ain't he can't figure out where to put it. Yeah, uh, always wanting to expand his garden. Yeah. So uh, go check out uh, Jason at Cog Hill if you haven't already. Uh, and we're going to get to some questions from last week's show. Yeah. And if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hosttools com with your address, and we'll be glad to send you a nice little prize. So our first question comes from Stephen Wyatt, and uh, he says, any update on the Cherokee tan pumpkin? Is there a taste difference? Uh, this is a two-part question. So update on the Cherokee tan pumpkin, and then he wants to know with the bunching onions versus the multiplying onions, is there a taste difference? He says both seem to serve the same purpose of having green onions, but the multiplied onions are more perennial in nature, self-preserving. So. I'll answer the first one first. How about that? Go for it. So the Cherokee tan, we had a pretty decent crop, and we got a decent stash of seeds. We're actually waiting on the germ test to come back on them now. So then the next month, we should have those. We, we have to lot them. We have to send them off for germ tests, and we bust them up in two different lots. So we're waiting on those germ tests to come back. We're not going to have a huge supply, but we think we're going to have a decent supply of these Cherokee tans for next year. So stay tuned for that. Let me add to that real quick. So we've got, we, we grew a small seed crop. Uh, we'll probably make a, a little bit of that available. It'll be limited supply oh, because absolutely. we got to take the rest of our seed crop and send it to a bigger grower uh, to grow us a big seed crop. So then we can, it's, it's a multi-year process. I will, and I'm going to add this one thing before we get off Cherokee to pumpkins. I talked to a, a breeder out in California and I told them, and I, I honestly believe this, it's the most disease and insect resistant variety of pumpkin I have ever seen, hands down, with the most vigor. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on. So the onion thing, the onion thing gets a little complicated. We got multiplying onion and we got bunching onions. We've got multiplying onions that are heirloom. We got heirloom bunching onions that also multiply planted in the garden. And then we've got bunching onions that are not heirloom that uh, the seeds is from seeds, and then we got regular onions. So I got a lot of different onions growing. I don't know the answer to some of this right yet. We're going to do some extensive testing a little later on in the year. We got this guinea onion that is a multiplying onion, but it is a bunching multiplying onion. And then we got the regular nest onion that we talk about growing. So these. These old heirloom varieties that really piqued my interest a lot. You're right. You know, you can save your seed stock from year to year, and they, they do preserve themselves if you take care of them, which is a great, a great plan. Mm -hmm. Some of these others that we grow from seeds, like these conventional bunching onions and everything, are a little bit different, and we're going to probably do some videos later on keeping that. So stay tuned on the onion thing. We've got a lot of good content coming out on that later on when we start doing our, 
our testing. They're all up growing well now in our test plot, looking good, and I'm excited about trying and showing the differences in those. All right. All right, so Mr. Seth Zinsmeister. That's pretty good. Yeah, he wants to know from Travis, why is it that you grow onions and leeks from seeds, but garlic and shallots you don't? Okay, so let's look with four different crops we're talking about here. Let's start off with the first two, onions and leeks. You can grow onions and leeks from seed or you can get plants from somewhere like Dixondale, okay? You can do either. And from my experience, testing both, it either works fine. You got to start a little earlier if you're going to do the, uh, grow them from seeds, grow your own transplants. The, the reason you do either one is just based on timing. For instance, um, Dixondale doesn't start shipping leek plants till January because it takes a long time for leeks to grow out in the ground like they grow onion plants. I've talked to Brian about it. He said he don't know what it is, but it just takes forever. Now, if you grow them like we do in the seed trays, you can grow them out pretty fast. So if you want to grow leeks starting in the fall and succession plant them like we do or like I'm doing this year, go from seed. Onions just depends on timing. If you want to have onion plants already in the ground, you know, we've got seed you can you can do that. If you want to wait till whenever the plant company ships, you can do that as well. We're doing a little bit of both. So with the onions and leeks, it's just timing. Shallots, you can actually plant shallots from seeds. You can plant them from sets like we have, the little immature bulbs, or you can plant them from plants. I think Dixon Dale sells shallot plants. So it just depends on what you want there. Uh, you can do it either of those three ways. Garlic, the only way I've ever heard of planting garlic is is from the bulbs, kind of like potatoes. You don't ever hear of anybody selling or planting potato seed. Can I add a little bit? Sure. Little bit? On your onions and your shallots and your leeks, you don't want to direct seed this out in the garden, seed for seed one at a time. You either want to grow them in seed trays or you want to grow them in beds from seed. Then you pull those transplants up and then you set them in your garden. They work a lot better that it's way. It's not like growing corn or it's beans. It's not growing like growing. You don't go out there and direct seed your, your onions. So you either got to grow you in a bed and let me tell you something, if you got a four by four bed, raised bed garden, that's an ideal spot to grow your onion plants. You can do that, seed starting trays, but you don't direct seed it out there, so we want to clear that a little bit. And the main reason that is you just do weed competition to yeah, overtake you. Yeah, it's just not a one. All right, third question here is from Bryn C. And this is a question from Greg. Do you make your cornbread with buttermilk or sweet milk? And do you bake it in a hot iron skillet for a thick, crunchy crust? Uh, we share your recipe when it's perfected. Well, I'm still working on that perfecting, but I have tried sweet milk and I have tried buttermilk. I've tried several different uh, recipes there. Now, one thing I'm not going to do, a lot of recipes show adding sugar, a little bit of sugar. I'm just dead set against that. I try to stay away from sugar as much as I can. You can tell from I my, can't tell. my boyish figure here, I don't <laughs> do a lot of sugar. So I, I, sweet cornbread to me is just out. I don't want sugar in my cornbread. So I always scratch that out, but I've tried s several different recipes I'm still perfecting a little bit, but one thing I always do, I always use my cast iron cornbread griddle. I got two of them, both of them are well seasoned. I love my cast iron. If you come to my house and, and I'm doing some cooking, you can bet you it's done in cast iron. I got a huge collection of cast iron and that's what I cook with. And my cornbread griddle is the one I make cornbread on. So I'll keep you updated on that when I find the recipe I like the best. Yeah, in fact, you got one of those big man folds that hang from uh, the ceiling to hang all your cast yeah, iron on. I, did. I made me one that I hung up there. We got a high ceiling and I hang it up there. When I get ready for one of my cast iron pots, I just reach up there and get it, bring it down. Mm-hmm. But idea. everybody's got their fetishes. Cast iron's a little bit of mine. I, I quit it, but I used to go to a flea market and I found an old good cast iron pot boy I get to shaking all over and I have to end up buying it but I bought so many of them I've had to work myself out of that and I try not to buy no more cast iron because I got way more than I'll ever use you can't cook but one or two at a you time can't. that's right all right so hope you guys enjoyed this week's show next week I can't promise but there's a good chance we'll be in our new studio next week and if we are then we'll we'll try to show you what this looks like zoomed out version uh, so you can see how we're moving on up got a lot of great things coming so stay tuned all right y'all have a good one we'll see you next week mm -hmm.